Hi, hi. Welcome to the Sparkle and Thrive podcast. This is your host, Joy Foster, and I'm delighted today to be joined by a guest who's been here before. She's written another book called The Little Book of Confusables. I'm very excited to talk about this book today with author Sarah Tefton. Sarah, welcome back to the podcast and congratulations on another fantastic book. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be back. It's great to see you. And I love how this one matches your brand theme and colors. You are My yellow wool. through and through. Yes. <laughs> and, um, but this is, so, I, when you when I got this book, I was like every single social media manager, copywriter, uh, you know, anyone who does newsletters, communication, website, they need this book. I need this book um, because it's... Th- it's all the words that we make major mistakes on all the time. And I love the humor that you injected into this book. Tell us how this book came about and, uh, and, and why it's so important for people to have. So I originally got the idea for writing the book in something like 2016. I started sharing um, my tips for commonly confused words. And it started with people using loose when they meant lose or spelling stationary with an A when it should have been with an E and all those things. There's a lot of people out there who choose to take the, um, the stance that standards of English are falling and it's disgraceful and um, young people today and all this kind of thing. Whereas I actually take the opposite view. I think it's amusing and I, I take it as an opportunity to teach people. And I find that because we all learn best when we're having fun and enjoying ourselves, that's why I've made the little book of Confusables a fun reference guide, because it actually means that the tips that I'm sharing are more likely to stay in people's minds and go, oh, okay, yeah, I created this mental picture to remember this thing. So yeah, I started sharing these tips on how to remember commonly confused words and calling them hashtag Confusables back in about 2016. And I spoke to somebody at the time who was a self-published author through Amazon, went and met her for a cup of coffee. And she told me all this stuff that I needed to know. And I was like, whoa, no way. I'm parking this idea. And I guess the start of last year, 2022, I just thought it felt like now was the time I'd been keeping a list in the meantime of all the confusables that I'd shared and all the tips that I'd used to go with them. So it was a question of kind of pulling it into shape and making it. I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is it looks great. Yeah, it, it does look great. It's like typog- uh, typographically gorgeous. Um, so it's a lovely, fun And book. it feels nice, too. It's got a really nice, it's got that really nice feel to it. And also, well, I just, some of you guys don't know this because um, Sarah's done some private interviews for our membership. But one of the things that Sarah talked about when, she, when we talked about freelancing was, you know, how even little things like the invoice and making the invoice look nice um, mm-hmm. makes a difference. So yes, what I love about this is it's a beautiful book. And is it self-published? It's not, uh, it yes. didn't go through a publishing house. Yeah, no, I'm too much of a control freak, Joy. I couldn't, I couldn't ever get a publishing deal because then they want to have complete control over the cover design. I had about 30 cover designs to choose from. And, um, and I kind of tinkered with it. I was like, none of them are quite right. Can we take elements of this and elements of that and use this font here and whatever. And like down the side, originally it just said the little book of confusables and it was all kind of quite tiny text I was like why not just have my name teeny weeny like nobody cares who wrote it um so have my name teeny weeny and have the book title there so it really stands out on bookshelves but as you can see it's chunky and it's stinky and you can even use it as a paperweight if you want to because it stands up on well, it's the kind of book you have desk. I have to say, it's the kind of book you have next to you all the time because you're writing an email and you're like, okay, is it Bear, B-E-A-R, or is it B-A-R-E? And what I love, I mean, if I just go to that section, we'll just start there because that's one of the most common confusables. Mm. I love how you've done this. Okay, so you've got Bear, B-A-R-E, is exposed or the act of exposing. Mm. And then Bear, B-E-A-R, is to endure, carry, or large furry animal. And I love that. (laughs) And then you said, remember, bear, B-A-R-E, always means, always means exposed or naked. (laughs) Think of it as bellies, belly abs and rear end. Need someone to be patient, ask them to bear with me, B-E-A-R, not bear with me, B-A-R-E. 
um, this is one you really don't want to get wrong. Who hasn't questioned, is it BEAR or is it BARE in that context? And the thing is, this is the reason why I thought this book was so necessary, because it's not a book for people who struggle with language. It's a book for people who are good with language and who use language on a daily basis to communicate for their business. So whether that's through social media content or email campaigns or proposal documents or even invoices, we use language daily. So the reason it's it's tagged, simple spelling and usage tips to help smart people avoid stupid yeah. mistakes because everybody, I don't care how good you say you are with language, everybody has language blind spots. And the number of people, professional copywriters, editors, authors, social media managers who've written reviews of the book and said when I first got it because really it's a book to dip in and out of when you need to refer yeah, you to don't it. you don't sit down and read it it's a it's a I need to find out what is what I should be I mean I just don't damp squib or damp squib for example yeah. so it's got a lot of those idiomatic phrases in but what a lot of people have said is when they first got it they did read it cover to cover because it's probably you could read it in an hour so they've read it cover to cover and they've gone, oh my gosh, I had no idea there were two spellings of the word hoard or discreet or whatever it is. And well, I didn't know the, the difference between a, chron a chronic and acute or poisonous and venomous or infectious and contagious. All those little nuances in language that we kind of use those words often as interchangeable and they're really not. My husband teases me because I, I mix, um, not intentionally, but I mix scratch and itch up a lot. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some of your favorite confusables. Which ones are, give us two or three of your favorites. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Do you know what? You're the first person to ask me that. Um, I would say favorites in terms of um, ones that I think are quite humorous. In terms of in the book, um, one of the ones that I really like that that is just a bit of fun is Warrior and Worrier like warrior and worrier, right? They kind of sound really similar, don't they? But warrior, an adept fighter or enduring person. Warrior, an adept stressor or anxious person. And then just throwing in for fun, Wario, Mario's arch enemy and the owner of one of the best fictional moustaches. <laughs> and then underneath it's got um, the tip. So think of the war, W-A-R in warrior and worry for worrier. So it gives a tip and an example of how to use the phrase on all of these examples. So that's it. That's one of my favorites because that always makes me chuckle. I like Jester of Goodwill because I've genuinely seen that misspelt. Um, that's another that's another good one. So things like um, white as a sheep. Go getter for go goal getter for go getter. But the funny thing about goal getter is that it kind of makes more sense. It's somebody who's going after their goals. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was one where language just evolves and goal getter becomes the phrase that we all say. But so ge gesture and jester. Um, an intentional movement, such as a nod or a pointed finger, intended to convey a meaning. And then Jester, a, a historical clown hired to entertain royalty. Remember, think of the J of joke and Jester. While a Jester of goodwill sounds like someone we'd all like to meet, an act of service carried out for someone else is a gesture of goodwill. So I like the ones that are a bit more lighthearted. So you had a lot of fun writing the descriptions of these words. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about, if you don't mind, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners uh, of our podcast up there, I know there's quite a few of them that have a book and in their, you know, in, in their mind, they've got a book yeah. they want to develop. So this is your second book. And let's talk mm -hmm. about what it's like to, you know, put your brave pants on, get that book out into the world. And, you know, what, what were your, what are some of your favorite par pro parts of that process? Wow. Um, well, certainly the creation process is is super fun. If you've got the luxury of being able to put some time aside and actually create a book, it's a brilliant it's a brilliant process to go through because it's just in, it, it's like you know how day to day we're uh, as a copywriter day to day I'm writing for my clients' clients. So I'm writing in their tone of voice and I'm creating a, a, a voice that suits their business. Whereas when I'm writing a book for me, for my audience, I'm being 100% me. Now, I know a lot of writers really struggle with that because they lose sight of the creative process 
for themselves. Mm. So what I think is so fascinating is when you actually start writing as you, you can just really, just really let out your personality. And it's funny because when I read books that other people have written, non-fiction books um, predominantly, you can tell when somebody is pretending to be the professional because it sounds out like a sore thumb. And actually, when you read a book like Survival Skills for Freelancers, my first book, which is how I first came across Tech Pixies, because you guys were so incredibly supportive of that Yeah, book. a lot of people like that book. <laughs> yeah, but I think, do you know what? It's sold in 28 countries. Wow. And even Confusables has sold in 20 countries. And wow. it only came out in August last year. So that's something that I love about the self-publishing process. The fact that, yeah... I do feel as if we're all a little bit too beholden to Amazon. There's not a lot we can do about that because I could have sold this just directly from me and that would have been great. But the thing that Amazon does is it does in enable you to sell to a global audience and makes that process super simple. Don't ever write a book for money <laughs> because every copy of this that I sell from Amazon, I make £3.31, even though it's eleven ninety five. So it's a very... It's a, it's a frustrating process if you're trying to make money. Fortunately, I did it as a side thing and I did it to kind of, it's quite indulgent really. I wanted to help people with this knowledge that I had. And I knew that by having the, sharing the fun side of the tips and not going, oh, this is disgraceful. You, you, you really should be better at spelling and not judging people because yeah. everybody, I mean, I have to look things up. I literally take a copy of this when I'm working usually at the lounge bar at my gym that's my second office so when I'm working there I sneak a, co a, a copy of this in my laptop case and I'm always going oh what is it again yeah let me just check this well that um, that's very comforting that the author of the little book of confusables uses the book of confusables <laughs> as writing yeah. and as a professional copywriter but actually one of the things I want to touch on as well is you know this the the self-publishing journey there is something beautiful about being able to have a published book in your hands uh -huh. that it gets you on stages. It gets you, uh, you know, because that's one thing I've noticed is when you get into the professional space, if you don't have a book, you're, it's hard to get on the stage. And oh, okay. I, I do, I think for a lot of people getting on the stage is a huge catalyst for their career because you're then able to speak to many people at once. And mm -hmm. I, I do, I do find if you don't have a book, it's hard to get on stage. And Often the events that I go to when, you know, pre-COVID and starting to go back to the people on stage have a book or a podcast or a large social media following. It's sort of yeah. like these are the things that you now need today to then get in the door easier. So mm -hmm. building up those social media followings, building up the, the a mailing list and having a podcast and getting a book out there. They're part of the natural trajectory of building your career. And you've been yeah. building your career. Your personal brand. Yeah, and your personal brand. You've been building your career and your personal brand for a long time, but you've done it. Uh, how, so tell tell our listeners how long you've been, uh, uh, you know, in in this sort of freelance space and building your brand. And twenty four years, I've been freelance. <laughs> I know I don't look old enough, joke. But and you're also a single mom. Uh, yeah, I, I, for, for 50, for the best part of 15 years, I've been a single mom. So, um, my, my kids have pretty much flown the nest now. My daughter's currently in Thailand, traveling Southeast Asia for three months, completely self-funded. Um, and, yeah, and that, that's I think that's a reflection of her, of her mother, you know, and I think that's so important when, um, it was so funny. My, my daughter and I were having a conversation in the car last night and we were talking about, you know, revenue versus profits. And she said, well, you always said when we got to that level of revenue, we'd go to Hawaii. That was my thing. Like, oh my God. You know, well, I said, well, when we hit a million in revenue, we're going to go to Hawaii. And of course we're, we're well past that now we're at 1.5, but I, and she said, but I thought we we're going to Hawaii. And I joked with her and I said, well, but honey, there's a difference between profit and revenue, you know, and I know that now, and you have to sort of go out and, and, and do it to then get to that point where you go, okay, actually now, now I have a new level of awareness. There's a, you know, it's not about revenue. It's about, you know, good, solid profit margins, et cetera. And, you know, so I think, but when your daughter is involved and sees you building a business, mm 
Mm. You know, it's it it, it uh, you know it sparks something in her. In fact, the other night we were talking, and she was talking about what she wanted to be, and you know, and she's exploring different things, and she could be an architect, or she could be a um, she could go into real estate, or she could become an entrepreneur. And you know, we're having these real serious mm-hmm. conversations about her future, and it was really fun. That's so amazing. I I think the well, fact that your daughter is three months on her own is a reflection of fully self funded. Is a reflection. It's a little of girlfriend. She's not on her own, but she's she's completely self funded, completely independent. She got a first. She went to uni. She was the, the last person I ever would have thought to go to uni. I didn't go to uni. Her dad didn't go to uni. Um, but she was the first person in my family to go to uni. She got a first in her degree in sociology. Super proud of that. And now my son, who actually did the layout. He taught himself in design so he could do the layout. I, I paid him. I paid him a lot. I probably paid him a lot more to do this than I would have paid a professional because he was he was developing a new skill at the time. So obviously he was quite slow at it to begin with, but he did all the layout. And then my graphic designer checked everything over and kind of gave it the approval. But it was lovely because he's studying English and creative writing at uni now so I feel like I've kind of done the single mom thing my kids are now kind of pretty much doing their own thing but I'm I'm really chuffed that George my youngest chose to spend his last summer before university working with me on this book it's so much more you know it's that opportunity to work with your children to to help your children develop but also this this um personal mission to make writing easier for you know I love how you said helping smart people avoid stupid yeah. mistakes yeah. there's so much goodness in that and your story behind it I think is really important what else do you want to tell us about this book apart from the fact that I think every single social media manager yeah. uh, copywriter needs this book entrepreneur a lot of times entrepreneurs are doing everything themselves I mean we've been I've interviewed you before Absolutely. about the early days before you were hiring freelancers to help you with your freelance career when you had to do everything. So, you know, it's the sort of thing that I think everyone who's anyone who's writing anything online needs this. Yeah. And, and I, I, I really agree, but I think it carries so much weight when somebody like you says that because you've got hold of a copy of the book and you've read it for yourself and you've come to that conclusion yourself. So that thank, first of all, thank you for saying that. It's a really strong message and it's also extremely difficult. And I've come to this conclusion because when I self-published survival skills for freelancers I had a lot of people kind of going well can you be on my podcast can you do us a guest blog can you talk at this event or whatever I literally said yes to everything literally everything and nothing paid none of it paid so full disclosure the year that I launched survival skills for freelancers my income halved Wow. And I don't talk about this a lot because I'm, I, there's a lot of shame around it. I can't, you know, I, I can't, um, I can't pretend there's not. And because I feel like I messed up, but actually I don't think I did. I think what I was doing was I was going through this kind of settling phase because when I launched Survival Skills for Freelancers, I'd never guested on a pod. I'd never done a live like this. I'd never done an Instagram live. I'd never done a webinar or training or stood on a stage. Now I've done all those things. So like you say, having a book or two books can be a key to kind of level up your business. But I I didn't do it right. I, I genuinely feel like I really messed it up because my financially, my, my year was a failure. But I always say, and I say this in Survival Skills for Freelancers, and I always say this to anybody who is building and growing their own business, success isn't just financial. So for me, being successful as a freelancer can come around to the fact that I've got the luxury of time, that I can create something like this that is never going to make me shed loads of money unless somebody really hugely influential Somebody like Susie Dent needs to pick this up and go, do you know what? This is like an entry level book. Have you sent it to her? She's, yeah, but I didn't get any response at all. <laughs> I tried. I sent it to her and I sent it well, to Well, you know, husband. the thing is at Tech Pixies, we, we have a program called Dream Builder. And one of the things that we talk about in Dream Builder is <clears throat> carrying around a dead Harry. And I love, I love this story. And I'll just, just be humor me. I'll talk, I'll tell you the story of dead Harry. So uh, you, you, there's four guys they're, they're, this is obviously an older story, but there's four guys They're They're walking around a golf course and one of them drops dead of a heart attack. His name's Harry. And they decide that they're going to carry Harry all the way around the golf course. 
So they carry Harry every hole they go to, every hole. They, they end up at the halfway house, you know, to have lunch with the other guys. And they're going, what is taking you guys so long? And I said, well, Harry died and we had to drag him along with us. And it's this concept that we have these old stories that we drag along with us and we have to process these stories, you know, mm -hmm. and we have to come up with a new empowering way to look at them. And, and one of the things that we say in Dream Builder is that fear and failure are, re are a requirement for success, you know, yeah, 100%. And, and I know Rachel Hollis wrote something like six books, self-published six books. Um, they were, none of them were, were massively successful. And then she became, you know, multi-time New York times bestselling author. Wow. So, you know, it's the process that matters. It's the journey that matters. And, and in the book, the alchemist, um, have you read, have you read the alchemist? No, I actually haven't. It's oh, you must read this book. I actually it's haven't read it. I know it's a classic. I will. I, I recommend it. It's on the joy book club, which of course your books are on the joy book club recommendation oh, list as well. You. But The Alchemist is brilliant. It's the story of a shepherd boy who goes in search of his treasure. And it's all the journeys that he goes on. And, you know, we, 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 if we're going to have a successful life, it's, it's not going to come without failure. And, but it's how we perceive that failure. And I, and one of my mentors always says, um, perceived failure. You know, it's, it's perceived failure. Anyway, I was walking this morning listening to one of the things that I listen to every day. And th there was a quote from Wal Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now, I've been to Ralph Waldo Emerson's home. I've sat in, uh, I've sat in his home. I've sat in the chair he wrote in. Oh um, yeah, really incredible stuff. Um, I've, you know, I've just, I've been in the room where um, they used to have all of the, the, the transcendentalist conversations. The energy in that room is incredible. Anyway, one of the quotes that um, came up this morning, which is so apt um, to this, is to, um, about success. This is Ralph Waldo Emerson's definition of success. To find the best in others, to give oneself, to leave the world a little bit better, mm -hmm. whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exultation to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. Oh, I and love it, that. Isn't that gorgeous? Wow. But when, when uh, my mentor was describing a redeemed social condition, what they're talking about is making someone's life better. Yeah. You know, if you, by writing this book, give someone the gift of being a better copywriter or by mm -hmm. writing the other book, share the light shed, you know, share, shed some light on what it's like to be a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And the reality is income goes up and down. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we, and, and obviously we're working to have higher highs and higher lows as we go and we evolve, but it's how we tell those stories, how we change those stories and how we say, well, you know, this is, this led to this and that led to that. You know, if you hadn't published that first book, you wouldn't have the courage to publish the second book and look at the gift that that gave, you know, your son as well. And all of us yeah. need it yeah. <laughs> and from the beginning. The, the thing the thing with survival skills for freelancers as well is that I know people, um, I don't know if you've come across a guy called Tom Garfield, he's quite prolific on social media, but he has been a freelancer, I think for two years now, and he credits survival skills for freelancers. He talks very generously about this. He credits that book, my book, for giving him the confidence to go social, to go self-employed in the first place. So he'd been thinking about taking the leap for years and had mulled it over and, oh yeah, shall I, shan't I? And, and, and never been able to make the decision. And then he read the book and then he took the leap. And I, I just love that. I love the fact that it's changed people's lives for the better and it's helped freelancers in 28 countries around the world. And then this, this book is helping people in 20 countries to write with clarity and to get, you know, we all need to appear as professional as possible. And when I say that, I think, feel like there's this kind of old fashioned concept of professional is, you know, you, you, you don't use emojis in your social media posts and you use really formal language, whereas I am all about the human language. I do a lot of one to one copy coaching sessions and training sessions on human language. That for me is everything. And this book is like the kind of the handbook to, to refer to when you're writing your human language because oh do I need to, to to write principal or principal is it effect or effect is it advice or advice is it practice or practice um and all these other things like the ones that are put in there off your own bat for example how many people write off your own back 
Like I do. Throw hands. Anybody who's listening, have you written of your own back before? Because it's bat. So there are all these things that actually, when you get hold of this book and you realize that you can find words that you've been writing wrong your whole life, it's kind of a revelation. Yeah. And again, I think it's so great that we 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 know a bit of the backstory. You know, I think it's great, you know, it's wonder it's so important. Everyone should have this book, but also you've got to know that there's a person behind this book and, you know, and genuinely someone who is out there to make your life easier as a freelancer. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I, and I genuinely think we don't know always what one thing is going to lead to. And, yes. uh, but we do know that when we take steps in the direction of our dream, uh, things work out and they find a way and we learn how to, craft a book so that it generates an email list. We learn how to sell to that email list, you know, so there's things that we can learn how to do and everything is figure outable, which is by the way, another great book that's out there. <laughs> everything is figure outable. So um, Sarah, I want to thank you for giving this gift to the world. And, you know, I think um, you have no idea what's coming still in your career. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's so funny. I heard Jane Fonda once and I'll never forget this. I, I she was talking to somebody, probably Oprah or Ellen or someone, and they were asking her about her career. And this was, I don't know, it, it wasn't recently. It was pre-COVID, I think. Anyway, she said, "I feel like I'm just getting started." And she just turned eighty. And I think, you know, She's for amazing. those of us in our forties and fifties and sixties, I mean, that's like many, many decades yet to go. Oh, you know, yeah. no matter where you are. So. I do think uh, I do think these courageous, brave steps, even though we don't see necessarily an immediate return on them as we are crafting our future, they're 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 bold, brave steps to move forward. And like you said, writing that first book, publishing that first book meant you learned how to go on stages, how to be on podcasts, yeah. how to do all that stuff. And you help people overcome their fear of becoming a freelancer. I've done 65 podcast interviews now in two years, which is pretty mad. If you want to listen to more, um, like get loads of free advice on freelance life and writing for business and human language and this kind of thing, um, go to uh, my, the podcast. Just put Sarah Townsend Editorial Podcast and it'll come up with my podcast page, which has got every single pod I've appeared on, links. You can just click through, discover some great new stuff to um, start listening to um today there are so many blogs with so much free advice on my website so i may not have a downloadable thing specifically but there's there's bad well, goodness Sarah, I, i'm gonna leave you with one fabulous tip okay because you've given us so many great tips uh, at tech pixies i teach uh something called social media crash course i also teach the social media superhero boot camp and one thing that we teach on both of those is the sales are in the mails so I am very, I'm a huge adamant fan that every single woman who has a business needs something called a lead magnet. Mm. So I would love for you to develop a lead magnet and share that link with us so that we can get people onto your mailing list so that they can continue to learn from you and get your podcasts and all that good stuff. So You know what? I, I had one, Joy, and I scrapped it. And there's a reason for that. And it's a very long story, which I won't go into today. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. I want to thank you Absolutely. for sharing this book, for creating this book, for sharing your freelance story, encouraging those who want to become freelancers to take the plunge. And uh, of course, you know, when we ever need to know uh, if it's inspirational or inspiring, if it's fate or if it's fat, or if it's dog eat dog or doggy dog, we know where to go. <laughs> the little book of confusables. Thank you, Sarah Townsend. Thank you so much, Joy. Absolute pleasure.